Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Real. I'm going to be the host for our 3D Experience User Group uh, presentation today. We've got two different presentations. Uh, we'll start with Matt Chirac, uh, which is our lead application engineer out of the Denver office. He's currently in Albuquerque today, but uh, he's still going to present nonetheless. So I, we thank you or thank him for his time. Uh, and then we'll have Bob McGoy uh, go directly after Matt and he will do a presentation as well. So um, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about your presentation or are you ready to get started? Uh, how about we do a little bit of both? Can you hear me, Bob and, and Brian? Loud and clear, buddy. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, like Brian said, my name is Matt Chirac. I'm an elite AE here for uh, CATI and I eat, sleep, breathe simulation here. That's all I do day in and day out. So uh, I've tailored this presentation to uh, sort of talk about simulation on the 3D Experience platform, uh, maybe from more of like a SOLIDWORKS user's perspective, you know, kind of what's extra, what type of stuff you can do in here um, that is maybe above and beyond what you would be capable to do in SOLIDWORKS. So we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the slide deck. Let me know if uh, I cut out an audio or if you're having issues with video and do my best to rectify that. Uh, but to, today it's going to be a pretty simple presentation. Uh, I like to let the video do the talking, so to speak. So I'll do a little overview of the simulation product that's on 3D Experience for you guys. Uh, some of you may not be aware of the different product offerings there. And then we'll talk about you know, some of the extra features that 3D Experience simulation offers above and beyond SOLIDWORKS, and then get into the fun stuff into the demo. So product overview, there's four flavors of structural simulation roles on 3D Experience. Uh, this goes from the bottom to the top. So the bottom role is the structural designer role. Um, and that does basic linear static analysis for parts and assemblies, some thermal analysis as well, uh, eigenvalue buckling, that type of stuff. Uh, this is more or less akin to a maybe like simulation professional in SOLIDWORKS can handle. And then moving up the chain, you get into structural engineer where we can have uh, yeah, uh, like hexahedral elements, we get into different element types, uh, multi-step analysis, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. And then moving up the chain, you get into really the flagship products, the structural performance engineer and structural mechanics engineer. Um, all of these solvers are based on the Abacus solver um, and they're sort of been ported onto the 3D experience platform. Uh, so this is where we get into the crazy nonlinear analysis and uh, the general contact, material failures, all that fun stuff. All of these roles can leverage cloud computing in some way, and they all include some level of cloud computing capability right out of the box. You can buy extra cloud compute credits to increase that capability at your will. Uh, I think the structural mechanics engineer and structural performance engineer have eight cores of cloud compute each, and then the other two roles are four cores each, um, I believe is the case. Uh, I, I'll correct myself if I'm wrong at the end, but I, I believe that's true. So um, those of you who may have used SOLIDWORKS simulation before, uh, it's a wonderful tool. I've been using it for you know, almost 10 years, uh, but it does tend to struggle when you start getting into really high strain applications uh, or applications where there's a lot of sliding contact, a lot of um, you know, uh, areas of a model that come into contact or separate things like that. So this is really the next logical step from SOLIDWORKS simulation to move to 3D experience simulation. And you can see a, a quick kind of side-by-side -side comparison of the same model between both. You know, it took SOLIDWORKS simulation uh, a decent amount of time to fail due to numerical difficulties where the general contact in the 3D experience simulation, essentially the Abacus solver, solved it in, you know, less than two minutes. This is an extreme example, but, you know, this type of, um, of comparison is pretty easy to do between the two. So some exper uh, some advantages, excuse me, of 3D experience simulation is obviously the powerful nonlinear solvers. We can do implicit and explicit analysis with this. Uh, SOLIDWORKS does not really have an explicit solver um, outside of the drop test study. Um, but there's more benefits as well. We can do the advanced element types. You can see my hexahedral elements on that foam block being squished. Uh, we can accomplish multi-step analysis. The general contact is probably my favorite feature because it handles that sliding nonlinear contact so well. 
Uh, we can implement fluid cavities directly into the finite element model, cloud computation, you know, the list goes on and on. There's just a lot of really wonderful things about this product that I'm really excited to share with you guys. So now we'll get into the, the meat and potatoes here, so to speak, the demonstration. So there's gonna be a lot of things that I'm gonna cover. Uh, we're gonna cover finite element model creation and the different types of meshes, look at the advanced elements that are available to us inside of those meshes. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful automation tools built onto the platform because it's this CAD embedded uh, ecosystem, for lack of a better word, we can actually leverage a lot of that parametric uh, data to uh, help us set up simulations faster, get into multi-step analysis, you know, and, and the list goes on. So the demonstration we're going to look at today is the front fork of this motorcycle. And our goal is to simulate, you know, heaven forbid, you're, you're riding your motorcycle and you hit a curb or something like that. But we're going to do a stress analysis on this to, you know, see what that looks like. So we're going to start off by doing some uh, assembly of mesh techniques using the FEM tools. Uh, we'll do some multi-step analysis. Um, and then we're actually going to fill the inside of that tire with a fluid cavity feature, which uh, will actually allow us to sort of select the inside faces and give the cavity inside of that tire a pressure. And then we're going to leverage cloud computing to solve it all. So let's get started. Uh, here you can see the 3D experience interface. Uh, it is a native app install when you're doing simulation. It is not in the cloud browser. So we start off by launching the structural model creation app. And this is where we generate meshes and things like that. We're going to do an empty fem here. Oh, my, my, my video got a little smaller. That's all right. And right here, we're selecting what parts we want to take, uh, take part in our simulation. So we're just grabbing the whole assembly. And uh, go ahead and accept that. And then we're going to go back and rename that finite element model to something that's searchable using the 6W tags. So we'll just name it front fork FEM. FEM is short for finite element model. All right, so from here, I'm going to open up this sub-assembly um, or this other 3D product that's below our, um, our, our 3D product in its own app. And you can see that I've taken this wheel assembly and I've meshed this on its own already. So this is a neat application for the platform in that we can have meshes of these lower level assemblies, and then we can actually import them into these top level assemblies very easily. So we use a contributing finite element models manager to take candidate FEMs from uh, lower down in the you know, parent child tree and assign those into our existing top level FEM. So in this case, we only did it for the wheel, but anytime you might have parts that uh, have multiple instances in an assembly, you can just mesh that part and then have every instance carry that mesh over. So it's a great automation tool so you don't have to go through and mesh each individual component. Right. So uh, that is sort of an uh, a, uh, assembly of meshes technique, as uh, opposed to like in SolidWorks, you do a mesh of an assembly, right? So you're meshing the entire structure um, on its own. So this allows you to reuse meshes that you've created on parts in the past instead of having to recreate them all the time. Um, or you can do a mesh of an assembly technique and, and sort of mesh everything from the top down. Or as we'll do here, we're gonna do like a mix and match. Some things will be uh, like that wheel is a, an assembly of meshes and then everything else will be a mesh of assembly. So you have a lot of flexibility here in how you want to approach your finite element model. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the advanced elements that are available to us. Those of you who might have used SOLIDWORKS simulation know that we can only use tetrahedral elements which is what I like to call these pyramid-shaped Legos right here. Um, that's the only element type supported in SOLIDWORKS currently, but because the 3D experience simulation uses the abacus background, uh, we can actually leverage hexahedral elements and more into our finite element models. So let's take a look at that. I have to click play on this one here. So we'll go down to our uh, mesh dialog box here and you can see all of the different types of meshes available. We'll start with this simple tetrahedral mesh. We'll apply it to this bracket right here. And we click initialize from geometry to let the software take a good guess at a decent mesh size. And we just click mesh. And then it's going to go through. That looks like a pretty decent tetrahedral mesh, uh, at least to start. And you click OK. 
And then from here, we just uh, we'll do a surface mesh, right? So this is going to be shell elements on the fender of this motorcycle here. And it's the same process for shell elements. We take a quick guess at a mesh size, click mesh, and see what it comes up with. And you can that looks pretty good here. So you would do this for each individual component if you're using a uh, mesh of an assembly technique, right? Where we go through and we mesh each individual component on its own at this top level FEM level. So this is gonna be a hexahedral mesh. So I'm selecting this part because it's just a simple tube and we'll click mesh on that. And I've left the number of layers at two. Uh, so you can see that it's just creating these really long like prismatic uh, hexahedrons here. So by turning that up to 80, we'll get a much uh, lower aspect ratio mesh out of that. That looks much better. So the hexahedral elements are really good for shapes like this that you can sweep in a direction. So anytime you might use an extrude or a sweep feature, um, you should be able to use this nice hexahedral mesh. We can add in localized mesh controls as well. So we're doing a tetrahedral mesh on this component and there's a local mesh size button right there. So we're gonna be adding some bolt connectors to this component. So I'm gonna select all these faces in here so that we can sort of increase the mesh size in these areas. Um, while maintaining a lower mesh size in the rest of this component, right? So this is very similar to how you might approach it in SolidWorks, um, adding that local mesh control in there and then clicking mesh. And we can see that indeed those elements are uh, smaller in the bolted areas and larger in the rest of the area there. All right. So uh, jump forward in time, right? We can see that the entire assembly is now meshed and we're ready to begin sort of connecting everything together, right? So there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of your finite element model creation. This, what we've done here has been created from scratch, but there are fully automated uh, finite element model creation like algorithms that are built into the platform. So if you guys uh, build a lot of the same type of stuff all the time, like a lot of sheet metal stuff or, um, maybe an assembly that has very small changes, you can actually set up templates for your finite element model that will look at your geometry. It'll maybe create mid surfaces on sheet metal parts for you, add uh, section definitions, add in welds based on you know different sizing and distances and things like that. So it's possible to have a, an automated template that creates your entire finite element model for you at the click of a button to give you a taste of this functionality. We're just gonna do a quick bolt connector here um, in, those, in the area where we had um, those mesh controls. So I'm gonna actually load the template of a bolt that I have uh, saved to our tenant here. And it's just a simple socket head cap screw. But by loading this template, it's gonna fill out all of our bolt properties. You know, the diameter of the bolt, the mechanical behavior, allowing preload, the type of bolt it is. This is a distributing bolt. So all I have to do is select an edge and then uh, I can select the face on the inside for like the tight fit area of the bolt. And then when I click OK, I've created that bolt connector, but I can take this one step further by using the bolt replication tool and say, all right, here's my bolt. Find me others like it. Find me other holes that uh, match you know, the size that I did for this first one. And it picks up all those other bolt holes for us and replicates them accordingly. And like I said, that's just a taste of the level of automation that we can offer on the 3D Experience platform for these simulation connectors and finite element model type connectors. So uh, next step in the process is to apply some advanced materials to this model. Uh, SolidWorks simulation, you know, we can do hyperelastic materials in SolidWorks simulation, we can do plasticity and that type of stuff, but there's so many more different material models and even other types of materials like hyperfoam and smooth particle hydrodynamics and that type of stuff that's available on 3D Experience. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, open up the material definition app, and this is where you can see all the materials that are available in my session. I'm just going to collapse this tree down a little bit. This is a big assembly, there's a lot of materials. Let's take a look at this hyperelastic material. We're gonna be assigning this to the wheel, or the tire, I should say, of our motorcycle. And you can see that there are a bunch of different hyperelastic materials available to us. I think SolidWorks has three, and there's you know a good almost dozen or so here. So I'm gonna to go to our uh, sub-assembly level finite element model and assign this material definition 
to the wheel. Again, we can build this um, assembly of meshes uh, from these smaller, kind of easier to digest subassembly levels. So we'll just go through our material palette, go and find that same you know, demo uh, rubber hyperelastic material, and then click OK. And then that material will be assigned to that uh, section at the subassembly level. And then when we get to the upper level assembly, it will also carry over. Right. So now we can get into the fun part of analysis, which is actually setting up the physics. You know, meshing and everything is great, but setting up the loads and fixtures is really the core of what simulation is. And one of the biggest advantages of 3D experience simulation is we can do multi step analysis. So you can see on my screen, we have a uh, sort of a, a four step uh, analysis that's possible to do on the platform that we couldn't really do with SOLIDWORKS. So we could add a pretension from the string on this bow and arrow. And then step two, maybe pull back that string. And then we can actually do a step three where we extract the natural frequencies of that pre-stressed bow and string system. And then using those natural frequencies that we've extracted, we can then get a, a good like modal dynamic uh, response out of it. So in our case with the motorcycle, I'm going to be applying a bolt pretension to those bolts we created. And I'm going to apply fluid pressure in the tire in this first step. So that way I build up the stiffness in the tire due to the pressure on the inside. And then I build up uh, sort of the stiffness of those brackets at the upper part of the fork with the bolt pretension. Once I have those stress fields in place, we can then do the curb impact as a secondary step and get accurate results out of there. So let's see how that looks. So uh, first thing we're gonna do is go into our abstractions and add the fluid cavity into the finite element model. Um, inside of the native apps, you can click F7 to hide components, uh, which is what I did there. And we're just gonna select the inside faces of the tire to apply this fluid cavity. We could specify an ambient pressure if we want. We're gonna grab a fluid out of my fluids library here. Uh, just grab a quick air. I have a couple of those in there. Right. And once we uh, enter that, like I said, we could specify an ambient pressure if we want to. We're just going to assign everything as like a, a gauge pressure when we do the, uh, the actual fluid cavity pressure. So once that's assigned, we do a quick F8 to bring back the wheel there. Now we can go in and start creating steps, which is the mechanical scenario creation app um, or structural scenario creation app, depending on your licensing. So we select the finite element model we want to use, and then we can go through and start creating steps. So anytime you have high energy, like fast duration events like this impact, we'll use an explicit step. Um, it's an unconditionally stable uh, type solver, and uh, it will uh, really handle this type of loading well. So we've created one explicit dynamic step, and now we'll add the cavity pressure to this, and we can use our selection filter here to just grab our fluid cavity. Right, and then we add in the gauge pressure here. Uh, it's in Pascal, so I think this is about 60, 60 PSI, give or take. Right, so that's our cavity pressure in the first step. Now we're gonna add in our bolt torque. Uh, you know, whatever the torque specs of these bolts are, we're gonna tighten that down. Again, this is through the scenario creation. So we go through and select the bolts that we created out of the connections. You can see them highlighted in the graphics area there. And we just enter whatever the torque spec is. In this case, we're going to do 20 Newton meters. All right. So that's our first dynamic step. So now what we're going to do is go into the feature manager. And uh, we'll expand that out. It's this box floating in my graphics area here. You can see a column for explicit step one. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and add that secondary step on top of it in order to move the, uh, the curb into the wheel. So again, half a second, that's fine. And now you'll see that there's a second column in my feature manager in the upper right. And now any loads that we add will be applied in the secondary step. So I can go in and assign our, uh, a couple fixtures at least to that, uh, that rigid body. So we can grab that again out of our selection filter here. And I want to restrain it in all the directions except uh, the one I'm going to move it in, right? So one of my favorite parts about the native apps is actually this robot. 
So let me show you how this works. By clicking that button, we can actually get a triad in space to um, to like orient how we wish on a on a local level, right? So this is the the robot feature. Uh, I think it's borrowed from Katia originally. Um, so I'm restraining everything except for the Y direction. And then I'm going to apply a translation in that direction inside of this secondary step. Right. So then again, we can use this robot and move things around, select directions. Um, they, they do make it really user friendly. So I think the translation here is about 150 millimeters in order to get this to jump the curb. And click OK. So now if we expand out the feature manager, you can see everything that's applied in step one versus step two. From here, we can start talking about actually getting this thing to solve. So cloud compute has been my favorite part of working on the platform so far. As somebody who's used SolidWorks simulation for years and years now, um, having my computer crank numbers all day where I'm trying to send emails has not been fun, right? But the structural mechanics engineer, structural performance engineer, each come with eight cores of embedded compute. So you can throw eight core simulations at the cloud all day long. And by buying credits, you can actually go up to 144 cores. So let me show you what that looks like in terms of actually using it. So you click the simulate button from the uh, scenario creation app. And we can run it interactive up to eight cores as well. Non-interactive is like, uh, run it, but close down the window. It still runs on your local hardware, but you know you don't have a graphics up. And then I'm choosing cloud. And with credits, you can go up to 144 cores. So that really helps with these explicit type studies. Um, you can solve them much faster. It, it, they scale up by core count uh, much better than an implicit solver does. So cloud computes pretty simple. You, you, you throw it at the cloud and, and, and let it do its thing come back to some results. Um, Post-processing is really straightforward on the platform. We can select each individual time step um, through directly through our uh, graphics window here, as opposed to go, having to go in and edit the plot definition for specific time steps. Right? We'll, we'll look at some animations here in a minute that I've saved out. But you can see the bolt preloads and the cavity, the fluid cavity preloads on our parts. Uh, we can look at displacement here and see um, you know, the displacements due to those preloads. Let me rescale this so it looks a little more interesting. So we'll just set this back to an automatic. So you can see that the tire is actually kind of displaced outwards from the, the pressure on the inside of it that we added. Right? We can look at step two, our dynamic step two. And this is where uh, we're actually impacting this wheel. So you can see in a stress plot, um, I've hidden the curb so you can actually see the stress on the wheel itself. But again, we can scroll really quickly through these individual time steps and see what that stress is at any given time. We can view von Mises stress, which um, you might need a new rim after this one, uh, after impacting the curb there. Um, we can go through and do uh, history and field plots. So for instance, if I want to know how much force went into this impact, I can do a quick uh, result force plot on the actual curb, the rigid body that is the curb, right? So I can grab that just out of the list. You go to a reaction force template and click OK. And then give it a second to load up all that data from all those time steps. But you can see through the first 0.5 seconds, which is our first load, there's not much. There's a little bit of force from the pressure. Uh, the wheel expanding from pressure, but then you see that force climb up after we start impacting. All right, so uh, we'll get into some animations here, but um, the results post-processing is really robust. It is, again, still done locally on your local machine uh, through a native apps. It's uh, not necessarily browser-based. There is a uh, physics results explorer widget that you can view sim results through the browser. If you're interested in that, let me know. I can send out a link to a blog article that I go over how that widget works and, and that uh, entire role. But here's a few animations of the uh, of the wheel hitting 
hitting the curb. I actually ran a bunch of different iterations of this, um, experimenting with different spring constants. So I have some spring connectors up in the upper fork there. I have some dampers up there as well to try to damp out things. I experimented with different you know, pressures in the wheels. And all of this is enabled by being able to solve this on the cloud. Right? I set up a simulation. I say, all right, solve this on the cloud. And then I can set up another scenario and solve that on the cloud. So it really enables engineers to do what they do best in the most efficient way possible. So what's next? Um, there's a promotion going on right now for uh, 3D experience roles. Uh, so for $500, you can get any combination of 3D experience roles you want for uh, a quarterly license for three months. So if any of you guys are interested in you know, checking out some of the simulation stuff, definitely reach out to your local CATI representative. If maybe you're not in one of the states that we you know, sell SOLIDWORKS in, call that number and we can still you know, help you out and figure out the best path forward for you. So that being said, um, I think that's all I have here. Uh, did any questions come in into the chat that I can address? I didn't see any questions come in, Matt, um, but uh, the chat is open. So if you do have questions, please post those and um, I can have Matt answer those as we go forward. Um, but yeah, great job, great presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. So I guess for now I can stop showing the screen and we can get ready to transition over to Mr. McGoy here. Yep, I will change to make you the presenter, Bob. Sounds good. You should now be the presenter. Okay, let's make sure I've got the right screen here. Yep, make sure it's showing the full screen, just not the application. Had that happen once or twice. So, we looking okay, Brian? I believe we're good, Bob. Awesome. So, I am gonna take about uh, 12, 15 minutes and go through a few things about the software connected that many of you are using today. Um, um, usually when we we start off we we get a hold of our licenses and we start working and we look at the the applications that are inside of that and some of those applications we we know we use on a regular basis and some of those we don't so my my goal here is to introduce you so, to some kind of tips and tricks and some of my favorite apps that are the least used apps in in my opinion at at the get-go on your onset so for those of you who are new to this the way the platform um, licensing is sold they're sold through roles so you can see here on the screen there's a smattering of roles up on on the display but for me as a SOLIDWORKS user and a, a lot of our users we typically use these three as, as the initial combination that we use on the platform. One being Collaborative Business Innovator, which gets you the keys into the platform itself. You've got Collaborative Industry Innovator, which gives you the ability to do that data management, that check-in, check-out, revision control, issue management, all those good things, um, controlling the governance of your files. And then last but not least, Collaborative Designer for SOLIDWORKS there in the upper left-hand corner. That connects your SOLIDWORKS to the platform so you can get your data up and down. So with that being said, some of the things we're gonna discuss today are some things that you may or may not know about what's in 3D Experience Solid, I mean, not 3D Experience SOLIDWORKS, but SOLIDWORKS itself when it's connected to the platform. Collaborative Business Innovator and Collaborative Industry Innovator. So I'm gonna start out by just popping over to SOLIDWORKS here and we're gonna go ahead and get started. And Everything today is off the cuff. We're just going to roll with it. We're going to do everything is going to be live today. So um, bear with me. This is for users, about users. So I want to get in and show you stuff live in real time. So here I'm going to go over and I'm going to search for a file. And I already have one in mind. As you can see, I've, I've searched for it in the past year. I'm going to go ahead and search for a file that has 2074U at the end of it. And as you can see here, I've got a few things that came up and I'm looking at them and it looks like I've got duplications here. It's actually not duplications, it's actually the same file, but multiple versions of that file. 
So I'm just going to drag this over so we can see. I have four versions of this file. So you're probably thinking to yourself, Bob, why, why is that the case? Why am I showing all the versions of the files? Well, that's how it works stock and out of the box. So let's go ahead and see if we can pare that down a little bit with the six W tags. So I'll come over here and let's start off by just hitting me in that scenario. So files that are just by me and we'll go with 3D models. So you can see that pared that down a little bit, but I still have multiple CAD families and multiple physical products of the same. Out this search, and I'm gonna go to my pull down for my settings. So this is going to that the search menu, going to settings, and we're gonna go to search results revisions. Right now, by default, it says all revisions. I'm gonna go with latest and greatest. Hit apply, hit okay, and now it's gonna reload. And I'm gonna do that search one more time here. And now you can see I only have the D1 version of that. And we'll double check just to make sure. I'm gonna hit just the 3D objects. So now I have the drawing of that assembly, the CAD family in the physical product. For, for those of you who don't know the difference between a CAD family and a physical product, um, think of it this way. Every time I put a part or an assembly into the platform, it's going to create a CAD family. And for every configuration of that CAD family, there will be a physical product associated with that. So you might have a part that has five configurations in it where you get one CAD family and then five physical products. Okay. So with that being said, maybe I don't wanna have to go search for my files all the time. So another way we can go about doing this, instead of closing my search, I'm gonna leave it because I wanna come back to it. I'm gonna go to my compass. Many of us don't ever go to the compass inside of SOLIDWORKS, but you can. By clicking on that, it allows me to look for the different applications available to me. I'm gonna minimize the roles here and I'm gonna hit that search in real time as I start typing, it's gonna filter for the applications that are basically what I've typed it in. So I am going to click on collaborative tasks. And collaborative tasks brings to me my list of tasks that I'm doing on a regular basis. What I like about this is it can be my to-do list for the day. So right here, if I click on this, I can see I need to do some comparisons on the differences between the different versions of the assembly. But down here, it has the attachment of that assembly. So as I'm building my, my work day in here, I can come in and I can start adding more things to it. So if I type in, say, the same number, it's going to automatically do a search for me and allow me to attach that assembly or that part to my task for the day. This also appears in the web browser version of it as well. But what I love about it is I can just grab it, drag it, drop it right on the SOLIDWORKS, if it's not my local cache, it will download it and then open it up for me. So you can see here, I've got my hatch for my little underwater submersible here, and I'm ready to continue on with doing my comparisons. And I can say, well, I'm doing some work on this, hit save on that, and then it's gonna automatically send that over to my working tasks. Now, if I come back over here and I hit the pull down, notice I haven't gone to the upper right hand corner and close a task. I'm gonna leave that up. By hitting the pull down here next to my collaborative task, I can go back to my search. I can also go back to my current session. So those things aren't lost. I'm able to go back to those at any given time, which is great for me because I'm one of those people, I don't like to redo my work. So having to research for things is not, not my cup of tea. So those are a couple things that I do on a regular basis inside of SOLIDWORKS just to make me more productive on a daily basis. A couple other things here, um, I try to make sure that I'm always enforcing copying everything to my, my work directory. For those of you who have not seen that, that is directly on the C drive, it'll say 3D experience, and that's where your my work is. You wanna do that just to make sure that everything's in one place. So always a good thing to know. So let's go ahead and pop back over here. Already talked about the, the my 
My session pull down makes my life easier because I can go back to my search or any of my task at any given time. Ah, the info icon. Let's go back to that for a second. So I'm going to go back to my search. And if I click on this right here and click on the information button, it brings me some pretty relevant information about this assembly right inside the Sour user interface. One, it gives me an idea of what that quote unquote data card looks like on the platform. It gives me the ability to do a threaded conversation about that. So And now I actually have a historical reference of the things I've been working on with that. I can also see the relationships. Where is this assembly actually being used? So I can go up and down the tree. I can see how many children it has. Is it a member of another assembly? So right there, just from the search, hitting that information button, you get some um, nice pertinent information. Okay. Collaborative business innovator. This is one of those that we usually treat this as, okay, you're in the door, let's get to collaborative industry innovator. But I wanna talk about some of these apps and what they do so you understand what they are. Do you have to use these out to shoot? No, but later on, they can be very beneficial. So let's go ahead and pop over to my web browser here. I have a completely empty dashboard with two tabs. So you can see I've got my users group, my 3D experience users group, dashboard and I've got collaborative industry innovator and collaboratively business innovator here. So I am going to go to my roles and I'm going to type in business because I mean business today and you can see I've got a few applications available here. So most of us use the first one on a daily basis that are connected to the platform. It's your ability to create dashboards. Um, 3D play we already know about that guy. You grab a hold of a SOLIDWORKS part assembly. Um, you grab a hold of a composer file. It'll actually give you pan, rotate, and zoom of those objects right inside of there. 3D search, we've already done that right inside of SOLIDWORKS. But one we may not use on a regular basis is 3D drive. So let's go ahead and pop that one over and talk about that for a second. So what does this do for me as a user? Well, one, if you install 3D Drive actually on your machine through the add-in, you can have a folder that syncs from the 3D Experience platform to your hard drive. This is completely separate from data management though. It is not managing revisions. It's just a save up to the, to the platform. Where I see a major benefit to this is when you want to share data with somebody that is not on the platform. So let me go ahead and look here. You can see one of these folders does not quite look like the others. So if I go ahead and select this and go to the information button, that information button's pretty nice. I can see, well, who owns it, who created it, what the name of it is, but I can also see who has access to it. Right now, I'm the only person in the platform that has access to it because it's a folder I created. But here's where it can get fun. If you want to share a file with somebody that is not part of your platform, that does not have a role, you can still share that file. What, now, with that being said, you are taking it out of the PDM aspect of the platform. So then it's disconnected from it. So the governance of that is not controlled. But what we can do is we can come in here and say access by link. And with that being said, I can restrict it to certain people, but I can send that, I can copy that link and email it to somebody. The only thing that they are going to need is a 3D experience passport, which costs you nothing. So with that being said, <clears throat> they go to a 3D experience login, they create a passport, you send the link, they log in with their passport, username and ID, they can use 3D play and they can download the file. So, so for some of you, you may have saw that I just went full screen on this particular app and it actually made the tabs disappear. 
To minimize that, I exit full screen. If you want to leave your tabs available, just double click on the top of any one of the apps you're working on and it goes back. So I need to speed up a little bit here. So let's go ahead and look at the next app. So some of us use 3D Swim um, to be part of communities. The, the 3D Experience User Group has a community here. So if I go into my communities, I can go into my 3D Experience Users Group and Keith Schaefer's posted some stuff, I posted some stuff up here. But as you, you and your team are using the communities and you wanna get a better understanding of how that community is being used, there is the Swim Analytics, which is pretty amazing. What this tool does, it allows you to see, based upon the community you're looking at, and the dates that you're asking about, let's just go back to last year when things started, we can see how much media has been posted, who's been viewing things. There's quite a bit of data in here that is very beneficial. So we can see who's been doing the most posts, who's been doing the most views, who's actually using that community, which is, which is really nice. So let's take a look here. Metric Reader. If you're like me, many times I spend quite a bit of my day looking at an Excel document for certain numbers or KPIs or that sort of thing. And the metrics reader will do that for you. And let's go ahead and let that one load up here. Just give it a second. So the metrics reader allows me to either put in static information and read those metrics, or I can actually have a live link from say a SharePoint location or a OneDrive location and have a charted bit of information right then and there. So for some reason, mine's not loading up. So let's just go ahead and delete that one and put another one on. So while that's loading, let's go ahead and look at the next one here. So many times when we're using our swim communities, we want to convey more than just a screenshot. It could be, I want to convey a markup or I want to convey something a little bit more like a presentation. Well, if I put a PowerPoint up there, well, I have to download the PowerPoint or do it as a series of slides. 3D Story is kind of interesting in the fact that it allows me to build a quick presentation that is shared inside of our Swim community. So I can come in here, let's go ahead and just grab a hold of an element here. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna look for the communities available to me and then where I can post those to. Now, for those of you who wanna look more into this tool, the guided tour is very quick and allows you to step-by-step. -step. It's very much like a, a slide deck presentation. And it looks like I forgot to close out my Outlook. Apologize for that. So let's take a look at users groups. We're all part of a users group right now. So users groups, what this allows us to do is create groups or teams right off the get go that we can assign to other projects or things. So let's say I go in and I create a collaborative space and I don't have to invite 15 people to it. Well, I have my design team here, or I can say all groups here, I have these teams that already have people inside of them. So if I click on this team, you can see I've got myself, Todd Myers, and Todd Myers, you must have two logins, Keith Schaefer and Randy Simmons. By having a users group, I can assign the group or team to a particular task or a particular um, collaborative space and not have to worry about manually putting each one of them in. So that's what a users group is for. So let's take a look here. I got a few more things I wanna go through on Collaborative Industry Innovator. So we'll go ahead and look at Collaborative Industry Innovator here. Excuse me one second while I get a drink of water. So many of us use 
quite a few aspects of collaborative industry innovator on a regular basis. One of those being a 3D space. So if you're checking anything into the platform, you're putting it into a 3D space. So let's go ahead and put that in there. And let's also talk about, let's say collaborative lifecycle for a minute. Collaborative lifecycle, we know that this is the tool we use to drag and drop our files onto and change the workflow state of those. So if I come in, grab a hold of a file here real quick. That's okay, I just grabbed it from the wrong user interface, but that's fine. Let's go ahead and grab it from here. Yep, that's fine. So go ahead and grab a hold of that one. Give me one second here, guys. That's fine. I'm working on two different platforms at the same time. So let's go ahead and look at another app here. This is actually one of my favorites. Let's go ahead and look at 3D Compare. So I'm gonna switch to a different one here. Give me one second. Ah, so here's my metrics reader loaded up. As you can see, this is information actually coming off of an Excel document that's live outside of my SharePoint. So I can pull this information and see that at any given time. Here, I'm gonna go in and we're gonna look at that compare tool real quick. So 3D Compare, pretty nice looking tool here. And let's see what it does for us. So I'm gonna go in and type in, what is it, my 2074U. Actually, this will work too. So I'm gonna grab a hold of my dart gun here. And then from my dart gun, I can go grab a completely different version of the dart gun and compare them. Now you can see the handle on the left was was a big ad during a during a meeting there, but so let's go ahead and get that going. So you can see this yellow piece was something that got added from, from C1 to the C, actually A1. So I can come in and remove any identical components. So you can see there's some slight change in some of the components there. So this allows me to visually see differences between the components without even opening them up inside of SolidWorks. So that one comes in pretty handy. Project product structure. Let's go ahead and take a look at that one as well. So product structure explorer. This one is pretty incredible little tool. Let's go ahead and get rid of some of these extra things here. Grab a file here. And it allows me to see the full structure of the assembly visually and from a point of view of a bill of materials without opening it up inside of SOLIDWORKS, right inside of a, a, a view from my phone, from my iPad, anywhere you want to go. 
and you can maximize any one of these at any given time. Let's go ahead and see if we can make that look a little better here. If your geometry does look a little jagged, you can go into these tools and change the geometry quality to high, and that will refresh there, and we'll get a better look and feel of our geometry, as you can see right there. So, so sometimes they're optimized for mobile use, so that way I'm not waiting for that geometry to paint on a mobile device. But at any given time, you can go through and look at that data. So another one that comes into play quite a bit is the bookmark editor. Bookmark editor is probably hands down one of those tools that many of us know about, but very rarely use. Um, it allows you to basically drag and drop physical products or any item for that matter on there and have a place to go back to without having to do searches. But what I use it for is actually managing files that are not CAD files. So here I have a composer document that composer does not have a interface into the platform yet. So if I want to put it up there, I drag and drop it on and it, it manages it. But you can see right here, I have more than one version of that. So to do this, I can take whatever document I want, right click and say, edit that item. By doing it, what it does is it downloads that file to my local downloads directory. It also locks the file. So then I can come into that directory, open up Composer, load that file up, make my changes. So let's do that very quickly. Just so we can see some sort of change happen here, I'm gonna make that hatch kind of a teal color. We're gonna update my default view. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to update those views with selected actor. So now all the views have updated there. I'm gonna save that document. So we, now we have a change. Now that that's done, I am going to say update. If I didn't make any changes, I can say undo the edit. Now this is different than download. If I, if I just wanted to download the file, I could hit download, but here I wanna edit it and actually lock the file. So here it's already been locked. I have ownership of it. I'm gonna update that and it asks me to go find that file. So I'm gonna go back to my downloads, grab hold of the file I just saved, and change colors. It's gonna upload that file, it's going to unlock it automatically, and then after it's done and everything has gone through its cycle, that will automatically rev to a two. It's just have to do a refresh and it'll update. So had a couple questions pop over here. Um, okay, I'll leave those up for Matt as we go. Let's see, a couple other things that I wanna hit. Yeah, let's go ahead and look at 3D markup here. So let's go back over to my dashboard. Minimize this one and 3D markup. So I'll go 3D. 3D markup. For those of you who have not tried this tool out, I strongly recommend you do because what it gives me the ability to do is do markups and then share them with other people. With 3D Play, you create a markup inside of 3D Play. It's there while you've got that file loaded in 3D Play. If I do a markup here, it's actually creating a markup document that goes along with the assembly that you're working on. So if I grab a hold of our assembly we're just playing with, I'm gonna go ahead and grab a hold of that, drag that right onto 3D Play. As soon as this loads up here, you can see here's my 
my component, I am going to create a markup here. And I'm going to give this, let's go markup number two. And then it creates a series of slides similar to what we have in Composer. So these are like views. So I'm going to leave that as my default view here. And I'm going to create another slide that allows me to come in and I can do a section of this. So I can control that section with the robot. I can come in and start doing information circles so people can look at a certain area, maybe come in and put a comment in. Notice there it automatically pulled the name of the file as I was pointing to, which is kind of nice. And then I can put in maybe an arrow here as well. So we're getting very similar to an impromptu markup right on that file. And you can see that view is updating as I go. I can always go through these and play through them like a slide deck. To me, this is great, but taking it to the next step is even more important. So I can do that by coming down and say, I would like to generate an issue off of this, or I'd like to generate a change action. So for those of you who have come to my presentation in the past, I did a, um, a talk about change action and issue management. The 30 second overview of it issues anybody that has access in the platform that can see the 3D models can create an issue. Now, does that mean that change is going to happen? No, it doesn't mean a change is going to happen to it. That just means that I'm reporting an issue that I've seen, and then it's up to either an engineer or somebody that's in charge of the change actions to look at those issues and say, does this make financial sense for the company to make these changes? And that usually will result in a change action. Best part about this is you come in here, you, you take some time, rotate the 3D model, talk about the model you want. And right from there, I can click the button to create an issue off of this 3D model. I can even, it automatically creates the context so it knows the part that I've been looking at. If I have, it automatically attaches this markup as the the information involved with that attachment. So someone will actually open it up and see the 3D markup. And then I can ask who's gonna be assigned to it, who's gonna be the informed user, who's, who's gonna get information when this updates. And then I can come in and basically ensure that this is gonna happen. I can either start this or I can set it as a draft. I'm gonna set it as a draft for right now. So that will now appear in my issue management tool. So, there are several other things I wanted to go through here, but um, I'm probably going to be doing a blog article that goes more in depth for every one of the so-called apps applications that we have in Business Innovator and Industrial Innovator. So I'll probably be doing a blog article that just goes through every one of the applications for Business Innovator and then doing a blog article for every one of those that goes in Collaborative Industry Innovator. So, because these are all applications that you have available to you today as people using the platform, and I want you to be able to take advantage of all of them. So, I'm gonna put some documentation out here, gives you a brief description, and maybe even some videos on how each one of these run. Was I able to cover that all in 20 minutes? No, because as you can see, there's probably 40, 40 apps of the bare minimum rollers there's what 25 here and probably 25 on the other. So we're looking at 50 applications that we need to go through and talk about. And we're gonna do that in a blog article. So hopefully this gives, gives you a few nuggets that you can take away and, and start talking about at work and then keep your eyes open for, for the blog articles to come. So with that being said, go ahead and turn this back over to Brian so we can open it up for any questions and maybe talk about next time and let's see. Actually, there was a question that popped over. Can you share your results and are they view, viewable for 3D play? Um, Matt, I believe that's a that's a question for you. Um, you yeah, can sh I, show some simulation results inside of 3D play, correct? Um, no, 3D play does not show simulation results. You'll need the 
physics simulation review app um, that's oh, okay. included with the simulation collaborator role, but it's a very inexpensive app. I think it or role. It's even less than I think collaborative industry innovators. So, um, okay. But yeah, I posted or I can paste a link to that in the chat okay. here. Um, I, I wrote a blog about that role actually and kind of how it works. So awesome. That's that's great to ahead. know. Yeah. I'll, Oh, I think that just went to you, Brian. I don't know, Brian, if you can post that to everybody else, but that's a good overview of that role because it does more than just view simulation results. Um, and there's a few other capabilities there as well. So good question. Yeah, I'll send so, that to everybody, Matt. Thank you. So there's a there's a few other that we've 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 taken offline, but um, we'd really like your guys' feedback because these user group sessions are for you guys. So if you want more how tos, please let us know. Um, because, like I said, at the end of the day, th these user groups are meant for you guys, and eventually we're going to turn turn these user groups over to somebody to actually manage. Um, we just want to give it a, a kick in the pants and give you guys some content out to shoot. So um, please feel free to reach out to us and let us know what kind of content you want to see going forward. That way we can bring that to you and maybe get some users involved as well to start doing some presentations and start making this thing pretty successful. So um, anything in closing, Brian? Uh, no, just thank you and Matt both for those presentations. I think this was a good uh, uh, first user group meeting for 2022. I will keep doing this uh, the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, so March, April, May will continue on and these will be posted on our website uh, here shortly. So thank you all that, uh, that attended and uh, please send your comments, feedback. Uh, we, we welcome it all.